Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on death and dying and the future hope. And this is lesson number 12 in that series for December 17 of 2022, entitled The Biblical Worldview. The Biblical Worldview. What would that involve? Hmm. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come seeking to know more about you, seeking to understand these issues. Uh, we thank you for the guidance that we have from Scripture. Now, help us to see the, your words as you intend for us to see them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Revelation talks about some very serious times which are coming. They're even called the seven last plagues. But there are some very serious things that will happen leading up to those final events. Satan will mount a campaign in which almost the entire world will come out to worship his associates and worship Satan himself. You can read about that in Revelation 13. He will ultimately reach the place where he will threaten death to anyone who does not join his side. Satan has been working to get some people to worship him since his days as Lucifer. Wow. You know, and, and that's just scary to think about that. Remember that the seven last plagues happen after the close of probation. Satan knows that. So he has to do everything he possibly can before probation closes. Now, we won't know when probation closes, but he, he will know. I believe, I, that's I'm not sure. Revelation 14 talks about God's response of truth when the everlasting gospel will be preached to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Revelation 14, six and seven. So, with the devil threatening death to anyone who does not join his side, and God with, and with God on his side saying anyone who does not join his side will be eternally destroyed, you can be sure that distressing times, described in 2 Timothy 3.1, and every wind of doctrine will be blowing, Ephesians 4.14, and people will be following all kinds of strange myths, 2 Timothy 4.4. 4. Okay, Jim? Well, the writer is Ellen White. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and the Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lay the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 588. Let's think about the Great Controversy for a, for a moment. The Great Controversy began in heaven, next to God's throne, when Lucifer, the highest of the angels, wanted to be honored like Christ. Among the angels, Lucifer gradually sowed seeds of distrust in God, of God, claiming that he was working for the betterment of heaven and the angels. Eventually, the situation came to conflict uh, over the ideas Lucifer proposed. About one-third of the angels committed to Lucifer and many of the other angels had serious questions that God has answered over the centuries. The great controversy began on this world when Satan, the former Lucifer, after being cast out of heaven, accused God of lying about the death being the result of sin. So here we are, right here, you know. Yeah, this is how it started, and, and, and it's just multiplied down in, in our day. So how did it all start, Charles? Genesis 3, 4, and 5, the snake replied, that's not true, he will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. American Bible Society. Well, you will not die. That was a direct conflict of what God had said, right? Mm -hmm. God has stated unequivocally what would happen if Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's in Genesis 2.17. Myra? But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat from it, you will surely die. 
New you American will, Standard Bible. Okay, that's from the New American Standard You will surely die. It's, there's no there's questions about... No way to get around that. No way to get it around it. When the serpent said that, uh, back uh, in Genesis 3, based upon past experience, there had been neth no death up until that time. So. And, and I, I'm going to ask a question about that. I mean, obviously God must have... I'm sure he said something to Adam and Eve. And the angels must have said something to Adam and Eve about what death is. What did they say? No uh, idea. We, we, well, I don't have any record. Can we find any? But uh, the co point I was trying to make yeah, is no. what Satan was doing was not understanding that God has foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. Because it, must, if it never he, happened before, and, and he says, something, it's, if this happens, then this will happen. And but the life experience with uh, and when he says you'll be like the gods, he was telling the truth. So what you have is a really a mixture of truth and error, which yeah. is deception. Oh, yeah. That's that's what Satan does. Yeah. The deceiver of the whole world. Revelation twelve nine. So we as Seventh Day Adventist Christians need to recognize that the truth about the nature of man and his condition after death is bound at the root with the great controversy over the character and government of God. Right there. First step, the first thing the Satan's, Satan says to, to human beings, the first chance he gets an opportunity, God is lying to you. I mean, right from the beginning, the truth about death was right there. But you imagine the voice, the tone of voice and the mannerisms, yeah. so to speak. Uh, he he would, did it uh, very... I'm sure it was very, it was very smooth deception. and very, yeah. I have a quick question. Do these folk who are publishing these scriptures, do they believe in what they're publishing? That's hmm. a good one. That's a question. Good <laughs> question. <Yeah. laughs> We're into the deep weeds when we start. start to many of them. <laughs> well, many of them do not. How, how many? I got a book done about 1965 by a fellow by the name of Charles Merrill Smith. How to become a bishop without being religious, and what's mm. in, in, important to me out of that is a lot of preacher types don't believe what they're peddling, but it's a nice job. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to get calluses. You have a standing in the community. People right. look up to you, and it's a heady thing to have people sit and listen to the words that follow from your fall from your lips. Yeah. I and mean, that's human nature. The question in the great controversy. Just boil it down to right, just the bare essence. The question in the great controversy, right from that first step, who is telling us the truth, right? Is it God or the great liar? I'm sorry, I already called him that. Satan. This is my worldview, my paradigm. Jesus died the second death, the death that results directly from sin, He's the only one who's died that death so far in human history, which causes a separation from God. Remember what, Jesus, what did Jesus say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, uh, um, the only source of life. God is the only source of life. So the human Jesus was separated from the source of life. This was the main reason for the death of Christ. The life and death of Jesus give us a choice. If we understand it, and if we uh, begin to comprehend, even in, in a mild, you know, a little bit, we can choose to live a life as far as possible like his life, or we will die the death that he died, separated from God. Now, that's not talking about you know, heart attacks and strokes and other things like that. This is talking about the second death, which comes ultimately at the third coming. We are blessed because we have had help from Ellen White in understanding the issues in the Great Controversy. However, the issues and answers are described in the Bible. They didn't come, they didn't start with Ellen White. And I have here on the handout, which you're more than welcome to look up on our website at theox.org. That's T H E O X.org. Look up the one on uh, the Bible's. Uh, the great controversy in scripture and the other one on just the, the the issues in the great controversy they're right there you can download them if these are to be the great issues as we face the end 
are we prepared to speak out about them with conviction and solid evidence in favor of God's truth? Okay, Revelation 13, are we prepared for that? Is that mine? I think it's yours. Okay. Revelation 13, 3, 4, 7, and 8, and on. One of the heads of the beast seemed to be fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Now let's stop for just a second. We don't have time to go into all the details how we would prove this, but the, the, word, the term beast here refers specifically to an organization here, an organization of human beings here on this earth following Satan, people who are following Satan. So this is they his... They know they're following Satan. They don't. They don't. Well, you'll see that in the next couple of verses. Okay. Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast also saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? So you... Satan has power. He does all kinds of things. And he gives that power to the organization. And, well... Yes. It was allowed to fight against God's people and defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. All people living on the earth will worship it, except those whose names were written before creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. That so, was my big question to Gordon last night. I said, yeah. now, wait a minute. All people living on earth will worship it except those names that were written before the creation of the world. How can that be? Well, uh, we don't have a long time to discuss <laughs> foreknowledge here, but God has it. And uh, my only response to that is I believe God has foreknowledge, and I'm not surprised if there's some things that he knows that I don't. <laughs> exactly, and I think if you look at the whole Bible, as yeah. Gordon was telling me last night, he said, look at what God prophesied yeah. through his people, and did they come true? Yep. So we do have years proof. Before. Yeah. 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 Some things for hundreds of years in advance were prophesied. And it looks like uh, that things are coming to a climactic even more quicker than we think. Uh, someone just told me that uh, this lady was told by the banker right here um, that next year uh, there's not going to be any more. It's going to be cashless. They're studying it. Yeah, well, the, the, so, the federal government is trying to, to eliminate the use of cash because the people who... The, one of the big uses of cash are the drug drugs right. and, and so forth. So if you, I mean, the, the point is, if you eliminate cash, then the government can trace everything you do, which they almost can do now with credit cards and that kind of stuff. So it's not a great big step from where we are now. But again, looking at everything, it's coming to a climactic even. Yep. Uh, the, the spiritual father of 1.6 billion Muslims is a very good friend. El Tayyip is a very good friend of the Pope. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, verse 12. It used, the vast, it used the vast authority of the first beast in its, in its presence. It used, okay. It forced... Talking about the devil and his followers are yeah. using this, okay? It forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast, whose wound had healed. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. And if we had time to go through Revelation 13 all the way, we would see that in verse 15, he says, anyone who doesn't join my side is going to be killed. Is it possible to detect the works of Satan in the world around us? Mm. Very subtle. You don't hear it within the church very much talking about what really, truly is going on right now. Can we immediately detect when Satan tempts us? 
if we are rooted and grounded in the Lord, how can we establish a firm, unshakable foundation that will survive through the final events on this earth? Only those who have, I think, fortified their, 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 their mind minds will be the scriptures. Will We're be. working on it. Yeah, there you yeah. are. <laughs> yes. In all, our, in all things, our ultimate example is Jesus Christ. Look at what we know about the youth of Jesus recorded in Luke 2, 52. Beautiful. Sally? Jesus grew both in body and in wisdom, gaining favor with God and people. That's can, in the Good News Bible. Yeah, you can see from this verse that Jesus developed in all the major aspects that we expect from healthy humans. Maybe you can read us this next one about Jesus as well there, Sally. Okay. His mind was active and penetrating with a thoughtfulness and a wisdom beyond his years. Yet his character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. As a child, Jesus manifested a, a peculiar leveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb and truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. I'd that. like to have that kid. Yeah, <laughs> that's a Mel and White Desire of Ages, 68 and 69. Mm. When Jesus began his public ministry, what did, he, his, what did he focus on? Jesus' ministry had much teaching, preaching, and healing. Matthew 4, 23 says, Jesus went all over Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news about the kingdom, and healing people who had all kinds of diseases and sicknesses. Ellen White goes on to, to say that he would pass through a village <laughs> and heal every single sick person in that village. I have sometimes asked us in this class and, and other places, what would happen today if Jesus showed up, walked into our hospital with, what, 900 beds over here, a little ways from us, and healed everybody? And my question is not, would, would that be nice? Of course, it would be wonderful. My question is, how would it be reported that evening on the news? Probably wouldn't be reported the way things are going. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would, be a, it, would be a real, it would be a real challenge for people to try to figure out. As Christians and as followers of Jesus, we cannot limit our abilities in reaching out to others by focusing only on their spiritual needs. Once again, Ellen White mentioned that our goal should be to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. Education 15 and 16 from by Ellen White. Charles, you know about that. You give lots of lectures about how to, I mean, the purpose, the whole purpose of our bodies, the purpose of our whole systems, the, everything that goes on there is to support a brain that can think clearly about the issues in the great controversy and about God. That's the whole purpose. That is true redemption. If we get all these things put together, does one need to be a health worker to assist people with their physical health? Do we see this happening in the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world today? Well, I can tell you that our church is one of the largest healthcare organizations around the world. Can the rest of us who are not healthcare workers leave the healthcare work to those who are officially trained to work in clinics and hospitals and sanitariums? That or, needs to happen more and more. We, every one of us needs to be, even when we sit down at a restaurant, we need to be examples. I, we've had the experience, I, I'll never forget this. We sat down, had a, a, a restaurant, place we had, this is the first time we'd ever been there, sat down at that restaurant, got our food and prayed. And some people from other tables got up and came over and said, we were so excited to see you pray before you ate. Mm -hmm. well, I've had that happen too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might be discouraging at times to look at the example of Jesus. 
We will never be able to do all that Jesus did. We do not have his divine powers. But Jesus instructed his followers to go out with those same instructions to reach the multitudes. In fact, who was it that he told to go out? Do you remember that story? I'm, I'm, in fact, it's the one here, referring to the healed demoniacs. Do you remember Jesus went with his disciples across the Lake Sea of Galilee, got off there, off, the, off their boat, and immediately were attacked by these demons out of the graveyard. He healed them, put them back in their right minds, spent a short time there. The people came out and said, please leave. They were scared because obviously there's some huge power they didn't know anything about had happened. Please leave. So Jesus got back in his boat and left. And the, the, the demons, want, I mean the demoniacs, the formerly demon-possessed people, they wanted to go with Jesus because they felt safer with him. And, and demons said, Jesus said, no, stay here. You have something to say. And you know what the result of that was? These are the Decapolis, I think. Right? A few, it was in the area of Decapolis, a Greek-speaking area. A few months later, Jesus returned and started preaching, and the whole place came out. So this is the guy who healed the demoniacs. Let's listen to him. Mm. And who would have guessed from healing the, anyway, here's what we, we read. Jim? But they bore in their own persons the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. They could tell them that what they knew, what they themselves had seen and heard and felt the power of Christ. This is what everyone can do whose hearts have been touched by the grace of God. John, the beloved disciple, wrote, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. First so John, what's, okay, go ahead. First John 1, 1 to 3. So, Jesus, so John is saying here, and this is many years later, he's writing 60, 65 years at post experience. He says, look, I was there. I saw him. I heard him. I touched him. Mm. I can tell you personal experience, this was, these things are true. Okay? As witnesses for Christ, we are to tell, excuse me, we are to tell what we know, what we, excuse me, what we ourselves have seen and felt, heard and felt. We have been following Jesus step by step. We shall have something right to the point to tell concerning the way in which he has led us. We can tell how we have tested his promise and found the promise true. We can bear witness to what we have known of the grace of Christ. This is the witness for which our Lord calls and for want of which the world is perishing. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 340. The ideal of Christian's character is Christ-likeness. As the Son of Man was perfect in his life, so his followers are to be perfect in their life. Also from the Desire of Ages, page 311. Uh, heavenly things, excuse me, yes. heavenly beings were his attendants, and the culture of holy things, thoughts, and communings was his. From the first dawning of the intelligence, he was constantly growing in spiritual grace and knowledge of truth. Every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did, from the Ellen wow. White Desire of Ages, page, you, page 70. Do you know any children who have grown like that? <laughs> Yeah, now the, when the kids are born, the first thing they say, what is my tablet? <laughs> <laughs> or cell phone. I, that's yeah. right. How things have Bible-based Christians categorically deny the dualistic theory of the body and an immortal soul which is trapped inside the body. And that, of course, came from, where does that come from? Jesus. Greek, right. Plato. Many Christians today still believe that the immortal soul is somehow trapped in a human body. Other believers who call themselves pantheists believe that the human body will eventually be divine. They believe that God is a part of and in everything. So let us review what the Bible says about one, about our physical body, sorry. Should this affect the way we treat our bodies? 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, Surely you know that you are God's temple 
and that God's Spirit lives in you. So if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you yourselves are his temple. This cannot help it but make a comment. The Muslims believe in Ru'ah Pak. Ru yeah. means spirit, mm -hmm. Pak is holy. So when I share the gospel, the health message, I quote this scripture and I say, your body is the temple of Ru'ah Pak. You mm -hmm. know? And I'll say, yeah, can I quote the angel? Yes, you can. So go ahead and quote to this folk. You know, how, what yeah. a beautiful message. Yeah, we have exactly. Message. First Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who, are, who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves, but to God. He bought you for a price so use your bodies for God's glory. And one more. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. Okay. Are we treating our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit? Every day, the way we live, the way we eat, the way we exercise, the way we sleep, well, Genesis tells us that both Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. Myra? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And then God said, And now we will make, a, make human beings. Did they know what a human being was? Well, <laughs> well, nobody had seen one yet. Yeah, nobody had seen one yet. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all the animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them like himself. He created them male and female. Good News Bible. So then, sin came in and has destroyed God's beautiful work. So what will be the final conclusion? Sally? For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place and the mortal has been changed into Im immortal, then the scripture will be true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Good day, and God. you Bible students will recognize that as 1 Corinthians 15. Since we believe that the body is an indivisible whole, we must care for the physical, the mental, the social, as well as the spiritual, not only of ourselves on our own behalf, but we should help others with whom we come in contact. Of course, we must recognize we live in a sinful environment. Heredity and our environment are not something that we have control over. People die of various causes, sometimes completely innocently. And we could think of all kinds of examples, auto accidents and other things like that, that they were not responsible for in any way. So what about sin in our own personal experience? Mark 7, 21 and 22. Jesus said, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. What's that saying is sin begins in your mind. Yes. Yeah. If we're going to prove on all these problems, we must begin with the transformation of the mind. Psalm 1-1. One, one. Mm. Jim. Happy are those who reject the advice of evil people who do not follow the example of sinners or join those who have no use for God from the Good News Bible. In Proverbs 5, verses 1-8. to eight. Pay attention, my child, and listen to my wisdom and insight. Then you will know how to behave properly, and your words will show that you have knowledge. The lips of another man's wife may be sweet as honey, and her kisses as smooth as olive oil. But when it is all over, she leaves you nothing but bitterness and pain. She will take 
you down the world, down to the world of the dead. The road she walks is the road to death. She does not stay on the road to life, but wanders off and does not realize what is happening. Now listen to me, my children, and never forget that I, what I, what I am saying. Keep away from such wi- such a woman. Don't even go near her door. Good news, and, Bible. And I'm reminded of the fact that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was intended to be a protection for Adam and Eve. All they had to do was stay away from that tree. But if they came up to the tree, it would be a test. And here's another example. Stay away from that place. What does it actually mean to have the mind of Christ? Charles? Romans 12, 2. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of the world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God and what is good and is pleasing to Him and is perfect. Philippians 4, 8. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Colossians 3, 2. Keep your minds fixed on things that are that in heaven, not on things on earth. So how do we do that? What things are in heaven? Well, Jesus is there, isn't he? And if we think about him and focus on him, we can become more like him. How do we get these new mindsets which focus on Jesus Christ? Only God can accomplish that miracle. And with that, before I read Jeremiah, my life is quite busy right now, mm-hmm. as it has been for a long time, but building a house is all-consuming along with all the other things that you do. And it's, it's very hard to stay focused mm-hmm. on any one thing, but yes. especially on making sure that I stay focused mm-hmm. on God. Mm-hmm. Okay, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with them, with the people of Israel, will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his non or his fellow oh. citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least of, to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. So the perfect situation will happen when everyone knows the Lord. That's eternal life, John 17, Mm -hmm. 3. John 17, 3. The New Testament writers recognize this important point. For example, Hebrews 8, 8 to 12 quotes that exact passage from Jeremiah, and then Hebrews 10, 16 to 18, uh, not all of it, but almost all of it. So, Sally? When we are united in Christ, we have the mind of Christ. Purity and love shine forth in in the character, meekness, and truth control the life. The very expression of the countenance is changed. Christ abiding in the soul exerts a transforming transforming power, and the outward aspect bears witness to the peace and joy that reign within. Wow. From Ellen White. You want to read Philippians there also? Okay. Philippians 3, 12 to 15. I do not claim that I have already succeeded or have already become perfect. I keep striving to win the prize for which Christ, Jesus Christ, has already won me to himself. Of course, my brothers and sisters, I really do not think that I have already won it. 
The one thing I do, however, is to for is to forget what is behind me and do my best to reach what is ahead. So I run straight towards the goal in order to win the prize, which is God's call through Christ Jesus to the life above. All of us who are spiritually mature should have this same attitude. But if some of you have a different attitude, God will make this clear to you. However they may be, however they may be let us go forward according to the same rules we have followed until now. Okay, question. Can you imagine, can you even imagine what a life like that would actually be? A life lived like Jesus? Would it be possible to think so much like Jesus that no temptations would ever attract us or distract us? Hmm. Jesus told us in John 16, 7 through 11, that the Holy Spirit is going to be sent, sent to help us. Jesus said, but I'm telling you the truth, it is better for you that I go away. Because if I do not go, the helper will not come to you. But if I do go away, then I will send, you, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin and about what is right and about God's judgment. They are wrong about sin because they do not believe in me. They are wrong about what is right because I'm going to the Father and you will not see me anymore. And they are wrong about judgment because the ruler of this world has already been judged. I have much more to tell you, but now it would be too much for you to bear. When, however, the Spirit comes who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. Excellent. So why, why did he say that? He had to go to his Father in order to have the Holy Spirit come to us. Because they had come to so completely depend upon him that they didn't do any thinking for themselves. Well, oh. with Jesus is there, that's a finite. He couldn't yeah. be everywhere. Right. He, he, his, his, his spirit could be everywhere if he was gone, then his, which is his message, spirit of truth. So That's one way of looking at it. Yeah, there's two ways, of, two things there. So one, they're thinking, I mean, if Jesus is there, why would you try to do anything on your own? I mean, Jesus is right here. That's one thing. And then the other thing, as Jim has just pointed out, if he's gone, then you, and of course, it, it, very quickly after he left, few years, their, their per Christians are being persecuted and they scattered everywhere. Well, then what happens? You show up in a brand new place and you are it. You've got you to think for yourself. You've got to witness to the truth for yourself. If Jesus is in the people's presence, mm -hmm. that's just a finite manifestation of, 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 it's individual. But when his message of truth can get out there, and that's what it was referred to as a, as a comforter, a paracletos, yeah. or oh, those... And then in Acts 1, verse 8, Jesus said, But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be w w witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So could, I throw the, could I throw that in there with that? With, uh, yeah. Romans 2, 14 and 15, where it says, Paul says, When those who don't have the law, when they don't have the what we call the books of the Bible, uh, do what's right, it shows that the law is written on their heart. And that's mm -hmm. what uh, uh, Jeremiah sure. 31. Mm -hmm. And uh, let this mind be in you as in Christ Jesus. Uh, what Philippians was it? Philippians 2.5. 2 5, two, 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 11. Mm -hmm. 5 yeah. to 11. Yeah. So learn yeah. to think like Jesus. That's what he's, the yeah. message is. If the Holy Spirit is the one who can transform our lives, that would mean that only those who have the Holy Spirit are truly Christian. Is that true? How do we explain Jesus' comments recorded in Matthew 7, 21 to 23? Jim, I think that's yours. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one, me, only one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. 
we need to constantly remember that the main way in which the Holy Spirit has been able to influence humanity is by inspiring the prophets and the apostles to write scripture. The Bible is the Holy Spirit speaking to us on a day-by-day -day basis. Romans isn't, 8. Isn't, isn't the spirit of truth available for even those that don't have the Bible? Well, God will find ways to reach out to them, yes. Well, that's what Romans 2, 14 and 15. Yeah. And I think Ellen White made some reference to, uh, 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 to that. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, how about the people saying, what are these marks in your hands? Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah. Romans 8, 14. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's children. Charles? John 17, 17. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. We must remember that our challenges is not only to live God-like lives, but also at the same time, we must be reaching out to others. Matthew 28 says what, Myra? Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all the peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Ba baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Goodness so God. on our part, we must constantly do our very best to make good choices instead of bad choices. We need to recognize the Holy Spirit's guidance. Are we asking for the Holy Spirit's guidance first thing every morning? We live in a crazy world that is doing so many things in so many different directions. It is very easy to get caught up in some worldly enterprise and have it consume our time. Amen. Look at 2 Peter 3, 12 to 14, and 1 John 3, 1 to 3. We'll look at those in a moment and see if we can distinguish between being prepared for the second coming and getting ready for that glorious event. Sally? Well, Second, I lost my Second Peter page three. anyway, so I'm going to try and read this. As you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon, the day when the heavens and uh, will burn up and be destroyed. I thought they were going to do that this summer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, the heavenly bodies. And the heavenly bodies. Uh, I lost my place. Wait a minute. And the heavenly bodies. Yeah. But we, but we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will be home. And so, my friends, as you wait for that day, do your best to be pure and fault, faultless in God's sight and to be at peace with Him. Okay, First John 3, I can read that. See how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. And so, in fact, we are the... We are. This is why the world does not know us. It has not known God. My dear friends, we are now God's children, but it is not yet clear what we shall become. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he really is. Everyone who has this hope in Christ keeps himself pure just as Christ is pure. <clears throat> this is the very man who walked with the Lord himself. Mm -hmm. so. Do we ever get stuck in the idea that uh, my master is delaying his coming? What are we doing each day to assure that we are prepared and ready for the second coming? What are we doing to help others prepare? Well, Jim? Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 and verse 15. So then, as the Holy Spirit says, if you hear God's voice today, do not be stubborn, as your ancestors were when they rebelled against God, as they were that day in the desert when they put him to the test. Is this, excuse me, this is what the scripture says. If you hear God's voice today, do not be stubborn, as your ancestors were when they rebelled against God. Good News Bible. Then from the Bible Study Guide, the biblical perspective, the time of salvation is always, quotes, today and never tomorrow. Psalms 95, 7, 
excuse me, 95, verses 7 and 8, and Hebrews 3, 7 and 8, and 15, and also Hebrews 4, 7. And further, unless a major converse, conversion experience takes place, we will continue to be what we are right now. Time itself does not convert the unconverted. If anything, unless, excuse me, if anything, unless one is continually growing in grace and pressing on ahead in faith, the tendency would be to fall away, to become hardened, skeptical, cynical, even disbelieving. From the Bible Study Guide for December 15. If Paul or Christ were here with us today, what would they say about our preparation and our witnessing to others? I'll let you answer that for yourself. What can we do to make sure that we are ready every day? What are the criteria to describe a person who is ready? Ellen White, the great controversy is nearing its end. Every report of calamity by sea or land is a testimony to the fact that the end is all things um, in the end of all things. All things, yeah, at 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 hand. Wars and rumors of wars declare it. Is there a Christian whose pulse does not beat with a quickened action as the as he anticipates the great events opened before us? The Lord is coming. We hear the footsteps of the approaching God, Helen White. Maranatha. I mean, this was, what, 150 years ago that yeah. she wrote. Yeah. Okay. Myra? Live the, the life of faith day by day. Do not become anxious or distressed over the time of trouble. That's very hard. Yeah, <laughs> right. And thus have time, uh, the time of trouble beforehand. Do not keep thinking, I'm afraid. I shall not stand in that great day of testing, that great testing day. You are to live for the present, for this day only. Tomorrow is not yours. Today you are to maintain victory over self. Today you are to live the life of prayer. Today you are to fight the fight of faith. Today you are to believe that God blesses you. And as you gain the victory over darkness and unbelief, you will meet the requirements of the Master and will become the, a blessing to all those around you, to those around you. Ellen G. White signs the Times. October 20, Gordon's birthday. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. a few years ahead. 1887, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Lord is soon to come, and we must be prepared to meet him in peace let us be determined to do all in our power to impart light to those around us. We are not to be sad, but cheerful. We are not to keep the Lord Jesus be ever before us. He is coming soon, and we must be ready and waiting for his appearing. Oh, how glorious it will be to see him and be welcomed as his redeemed ones. Long have we waited, but our faith is not to be is not to become weak. Long as we have waited, but our faith is not to become, oh, I, sorry, I skipped a line there. Uh, if we can but see the king in his beauty, we shall be forever, forever and forever blessed. I feel as if I, as if I must cry aloud, homeward bound. We are nearing the time when Christ will come with a with power and great glory, and take his ransom ones to their eternal home. Review and Herald, July 14, 1903. And I can tell you, if you knew about the political situation and the uh, economic situation and so forth, about that time, just before that time, it looked like the, uh, the end was coming. It really did look like the end was coming. But now, we've had a delay. As we look around the world today, do we see evidence that the end is drawing near? Are there natural disasters occurring? Hmm, I wonder. Mm -hmm. Anybody heard of a natural disaster any time recently? Are there wars taking place? Hmm, 
anything like that going on? Mm -hmm. Is it possible that we could see World War III? Do we live every day with the clear understanding of the fact that Bible religion involves the entire human being, body, soul, and spirit? Which of the following two characters is closing, closest to being like you? And uh, let me just click on this. Well, you know the story, because we're running out of time. You know the story of the, the Pharisee and the, uh, the, uh, and, the, and the publican, the tax collector? Since we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians believe that we have the truth, are we inclined to act more like the Pharisee or the tax collector? I've seen both. Consider these what? I've seen both. Consider these words from Paul. I mean, sorry. Consider these words from Paul um, about what kind of lives we should live. Romans 8, 12 to 14. Allie? So then, my brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to live as our human nature wants us to. For if you live according to your human nature, you are going to die. But if the Spirit, but by the Spirit, you put the death of your sinful actions you will live. You will put to death your sinful actions. There you go. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's children. So do we understand clearly how to put to death our sinful actions? Our Bible study guide has a comment about that. The biblical worldview of human nature is a unity of all aspects of our existence, namely physical, mental, intellectual, emotional, volitional, spiritual, and social, aspects that do not exist separately or independently from each other. All are put together by our Creator God in a marvelous and unseparated unity, and everything needs to be sanctified by God, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. When a person dies, there is no activity in any of these aspects, as we read in many parts of the Bible, especially Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6 from our Bible study guide. This suggests that it is our responsibility to care for ourselves physically, mentally, spiritually, and socially. Jim? The brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. From the Testimonies of the Church, Ellen White, Volume 2, page 347. It's very interesting that she said that. I mean, that was before electricity had even been invented, before anybody knew anything about electricity. Uh, back in the 1860s. Right. In fact, every day we must choose between following God and exercising His values or following sin itself and gratifying the lust of the flesh, experiencing greed, envy, anger, pride, dominance. There is no cooperation between these two lifestyles. Colossians 3, 12, 2 says, Keep your minds fixed on things that there that is in heaven, not on things here on earth. In our world today, does it seem possible to focus on things above and not on things on this earth? Charles, I think Romans that's you. Romans 8, 5 and 14. Those who live as their human nature tells them to have their minds controlled by what human nature wants. Those who live as the Spirit tells them to have their minds control what the Spirit wants. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's children. Good news, Bible. Well, Genesis 1 through 3, you know about the creation and the fall, make it very clear that God intended for us to live forever in a perfect environment in the Garden of Eden. God has now provided a way for us to return to those idyllic conditions. Mm. What does it mean to have a new heart, Myra? When Jesus speaks of a new heart, he means the mind, the life, the whole being. To have a change of heart is to withdraw the, the affections of the, from the world and to fasten them upon Christ. To have a new heart is to have a new mind new pur purposes, new motives. What is the sign of a new heart? A changed life. There is a daily, hourly dying to selfishness and pride. And that's re right. repeated in several different places. Yeah. So how does that affect the way we relate, we relate to others? 
Matthew 20, verse 28. Jesus said, like the Son of Man, who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. Mm. Good News Bible. Many people are doing research on neuroscience. They have discovered some interesting things that support our biblical worldview. David Gushi declares, unlike the Greek notion that the body decay, decays while the self floats off to heaven, a biblical, especially a Jewish understanding, seems to envision no such separable existence between body and soul or spirit. When we die, all of us dies. In his book, Only Human Christian Reflections on the uh, Jew Journey Toward Wholeness. Nancy Murphy embraces physical and relational functions of our existence and stresses human moral responsibility. Instead of a soul, she uses the term, uh, the notion of self. The term self is used in a variety of ways in psychology and philosophy. What is at issue here is not the question of what it means to be, to be a self, rather the issue is that of having a self-concept uh, from the non-reproductive physical uh, physicalism in the search of the first soul, far views of the mind-body problem, etc. Murphy claims that humans are physical and that it is the brain that does the work once attributed to the mind or soul from the same book. Joel Green, using his background in neuroscience and biblical studies, states that we need a better understanding of biblical anthropology. He argues for the biblical holistic view of humanity. He stresses that humans are a unit and do not possess an ontologically distinct soul. Therefore, he rightly denies that after physical death, the soul lives in, indeterminate, in an indeterminate state. So there's three people, non-Adventists, non who have made very clear and very forceful states comments about uh, the state of and people. this one is coming out of Grand Rapids. Yeah. That is amazing. Nothing in the created human being is intrinsically immortal. Resurrection and embodied afterlife of God's doing, uh, God's doing, divine gift, body, soul. F.F. F. Bruce fittingly declares in biblical usage, immortality belongs inherently to God alone. Otherwise, it belongs only to those to whom God gives it. Again, where human beings are concerned, immoral, immortality in the Bible is predicted of the body, not of the soul. So, in our Western culture, though thought and language of immortality has been largely determined by Plato's doctrine, and we must stop there. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying these things and seeing the cl truth clearly portrayed through Scripture and through the writings of our friend Ellen White. Help us to comprehend these things clearly enough so that they become implanted in our brain so that if we're tempted at some point to believe some of those strange doctrines that we've studied about, that we may say, no, I don't believe that. I, I have a biblical worldview that tells me that you know, you are the one who tells the truth and not Satan. May we never trust him is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.